what lies beneath the masks of America's most extreme podcasts, the pod people. I'm Matisse Van Rossum, and my face is a work in progress. Hi, I'm Cleveland Mosier, and I've never seen a Funhouse mirror before. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Sheets, and I'm part of the family. Woo, woo. The gathering of the juggalos. <laughs> we are extremely excited tonight to be joined by our good friend Aaron Velusic, all the way from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hello, Aaron. Hello. Hi, how's it going? It's going fantastic. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. We did all yeah. of our small talk before we started recording, and now we're pretending <laughs> to do it again. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, we're we're very uh, excited to have you on the show, Aaron. We know that you're a longtime listener, and uh, Aaron went to film school with Ben and I. Uh, she produced my senior thesis film. She's a very talented filmmaker and writer, and we're stoked to talk about this uh interesting movie with you <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you so much for responding to me because i yeah like i told you matisse i was like three glasses of wine deep when i tweeted at you guys and i was like what the fuck is this movie and... yeah well i mean that tweet immediately piqued my interest because <laughs> i'm like well if uh, I believe your your uh, exact quote was, I have some thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes. I, I also, after watching it, have some thoughts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we are talking about the 2019 film Haunt, written and directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods, who notably also wrote A Quiet Place and wrote A Quiet Place 2 as well, which, as we know, has been delayed for the foreseeable future. And this movie stars some people uh, like Katie Stevens and Will Britton and Lauren Elisa McLean and Andrew Lewis Caldwell and a bunch of other people I've never heard of before. Oh, and it was produced by Eli Roth. So this is a, uh, a very interesting cauldron of things that did not turn out like I expected. I really didn't see any of the fingerprints of any of those people nope. on this movie. Not a one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Aaron, I, I'm, we watched this a few days ago, and I have been insanely curious as to what your thoughts were on this film. So why don't you, why don't you start us out and tell us a little bit about uh, what made you want us to cover this on the show and, and want to join us? For sure. Okay, so <laughs> if we're keeping with film school tradition, I'll start off by saying something nice and then I'll give my critique. So, <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, <laughs> so I think if you just took it at face value, like if it was October and you were trying to get into the mood of Halloween and looking for like a fun teen thrasher film, uh, I think it's like really fun. It's classic. You have all the tropes. It's set up very unoriginally uh, for a, a bunch of kids going to a haunted house. And it's like it would be a good movie to sit down and watch as a Halloween horror film. That being said, <laughs> it's nice. um, there's a lot of holes in it that I was like, wait, what? Like, I don't understand. I There were so many times where I was just like, I don't understand. And you're not the only and one. Like, <laughs> and then yeah like to that point like like I said like it's a bunch of tropes and it's unoriginal and it's nothing that we haven't seen before but it was made in 2019 so I was like I don't know why we keep revisiting this idea it's like to the T you know like the innocent supposedly virgin girl who is quote unquote saved by this main character boy there's like a Conic relief character. There's like a minority character. There's like a dumb girl character. <laughs> it's just very like overall, my thoughts are like very unoriginal. Yeah, it's and so it makes sense. Like a lot of things didn't add up. <laughs> it's so funny because you, you're right on the money with how it like hits pretty much every cliche of this genre. And mm -hmm. knowing that it was written by like the uh, Quiet Place people, I was expecting 
you know, some sort of twist or unique take on all of those tropes. I feel a subversion. I feel like those Mm -hmm. two movies could not be more different. And apparently they were written at the same time. Like these guys are pretty young and they got lucky with having their script for A Quiet Place picked up and turned into a pretty successful film that we all enjoyed on the podcast when we talked about it. Very high concept. And they wrote this thing at the same time and I guess were able to get it made and put at the helm to direct it after the success of A Quiet Place. And it's like those two movies go in such different directions. One is like legitimately quite clever and well-written and the other one (laughs) is just like, this one is as you have both said, completely trope rattled. Well, what, what's the name like, of the that the Hulu series? Turn off the dark. What is uh, it? Uh, into, into the, the dark. dark. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, right. The Spider Man <laughs> musical. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Into the dark. It, it, it felt like an Into the Dark special with a little bit more budget put into the set design. Yep, slightly higher budget. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it screams like Shutter exclusive. You know, like mid low. I think it is budget. a Shutter yeah. exclusive. Actually, yeah, yeah. Well, it screams that because it's unambitious mid to low budget you know not as trashy as like the low low budget stuff uh Mm -hmm. it's got that pedigree of like online streaming service at least in the the aesthetic i think i might have liked it better if it had been trashier you know i I think so too (laughs) if they had if they had gone in like a more extreme like exploitation Mm -hmm. kind of direction i think it would have been easier to forgive the kind of generic forgettable plot yeah well this film needed to lean in some direction and i think this movie is at its best when it leans into those more extreme over the top moments like the kills yeah or the clouds. Well, I thought it was going to be... I, I expected at some point like a cabin in the woods type thing because I was like, oh, it's Eli Roth. Like, this has got to be a joke, right? Like, this is <laughs> this is making fun of horror films. And at no point did they like allude that it was like actually a joke. Like, I felt like it was taken yeah, very the, seriously. The, the, like, oh. right, yeah. the, the subversion <laughs> is there is no subversion. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, what the hell? Yeah, <laughs> we, spent, we spent the whole movie like looking for a twist that never happened. Boy, didn't we? And, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I I will say, like, to take Aaron's tact of, like, saying something nice before I say (laughs) inevitably a lot of really bad things about this movie, um, that I think it has some cool ideas that are not cliched, that are not tropey, but I don't think it ever leans into those in a satisfying enough way. The premise is, like, Mm -hmm. it's a group of college kids who, on Halloween, go to uh, a haunted house that is, like, an an extreme haunted house. And, and, you know, turns out, like, uh, of course, the people... It's more extreme than they thought. The (laughs) people who are running it are crazy murderers and And, you know, I think in and of itself, like that idea of using a haunted house on Halloween to mask a murder rampage is pretty interesting. You can get away with like we even see them get away with like murdering a couple of people in front of the kids who don't Mm -hmm. realize that it's like real. I think that that idea has (laughs) some legs but it like Mm -hmm. it stumbles out of the gate and then falls on its face and never gets back up yeah the idea is Mm -hmm. fun yeah i would agree because the only part where i thought it was going to take a turn was when that girl was in that coffin and the spiders started to fall on her because i was like she mentioned that spiders were like one of her biggest fears so i was like oh they're listening to everyone's biggest fears and they're gonna play on that and everyone's gonna like have their little taste of Mm -hmm. horror, but that didn't end up really happening. It was kind of a mess. Like it only half happened with like the heroine and then that one girl. Yeah. Yeah. And it it was only for, it was for plot. It wasn't because the, the killer set it up specifically for them. Cause the killers didn't know them. Right. Like, what the hell? And, like, so many of the things they set up are so, like, deflated almost immediately. Like, the spider bit is a great example because, like, you have the characters having to go through, like, this trap door hidden in a coffin, like, one at a time. The first few make it through okay, and then the last girl, like, they start dumping, like, real spiders on her. And uh-huh. you think that they're going to, like, grab her and kill her or something. It's like, ooh, she's not going to come out of the coffin. And when the other... 
when her friends open the door like spiders are gonna spill out but no instead <laughs> she comes out and she's like there were real spiders in there and they were like oh it's probably just uh fake plastic spiders they bought at a halloween store <laughs> like you're so like you're so gullible you're so easily scared it's like what happened to all of those spiders well, when yeah, she came out go? of the, the most coffin? Where frustrating <laughs> part about that too was like earlier the scene right before when they're like walking through the spider webs there's like an actual spider on her head like walking around right. and they, they cut to it and then it's, it's never no mentioned again she no, pay off. Notice. no payoff at all <laughs> I don't know if that's supposed to be like foreshadowing <laughs> but foreshadowing so, what? <laughs> foreshadowing her getting some spiders dumped on her and then forgetting about it five minutes later yeah. well, this film keeps doing that like it keeps setting up for no payoff yeah you know, the the ex-boyfriend you know is another example of that like oh all the setup. Yeah. i want to setup. talk about the ex-boyfriend for sure all right <laughs> well let's talk about the ex-boyfriend aaron okay first of all he's painted from scene one as abusive like yes. it's you know that's the opening scene but then he's also kind of painted as a potential hero because that other guy like gives his location, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And we see and so, that like, yeah, the, the abusive ex-boyfriend is like coming to the rescue. He's like following right, the location. What kind of message is that sending? And then doesn't he just die? Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. As soon as he as gets soon there. As he shows up. Yeah. yeah. I, it was it was so confusing. Like that was maybe one of the only things that I thought was maybe almost a lazy subversion yeah. kind of just because like first they do paint him as the as a villain like our heroine thinks that he's the one who's responsible for this haunted house right like mm -hmm. at one point she thinks that like the the guy in the devil costume is the ex-boyfriend even though we see <laughs> the ex-boyfriend later and he's like a good six to seven inches shorter than the guy in the devil costume <laughs> oh like, nice you'd, you'd think she'd know how tall her boy boyfriend was but <laughs> and then it's like so even though he's been portrayed completely villainously up to this point like you said the opening scene is her putting makeup on over a black eye that he has presumably given her so like immediate scumbag and then it's like mm -hmm. oh well we better hope he gets here to save the day he's the only one mm -hmm. who can come in from the outside and he, he shows up you and might dies. call it you might call it a deus ex boyfriend <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> or a boy i think it would be a boyfriend ex, ex machina, machina. Yeah. <laughs> but ex boyfriend you know. yeah <laughs> deus ex boyfriend just like on the subject of the characters i made a note Ugh. cleveland about 10 minutes into the movie uh, a direct quote from Cleveland is, I can't wait for all of these characters to be murdered. And I could not, <laughs> I could not agree with you more. Yeah. Which I felt was somewhat by design. They're all sort of portrayed to be assholes or unlikable, like, so they can get killed off. That's a fairly tropey thing to I don't do. Even, I don't but... even think our heroine is, like, is particularly interesting. Oh, no. no. Or She's so passive. Mm -hmm. she, yeah. She makes, she makes the exact same facial expression for the entire movie, which is like... <laughs> like mildly distressed slash mopey it's like that is she even even when like her friends are being murdered and bad stuff is happening she can like barely muster up more emotion than that and it was driving me insane what, what i will say for the actors is I feel like they were doing what they could with the material they had. I never felt like any of them were particularly terrible no. or had poor deliveries, but but like, I mean, God, they were just the writing for them was just so bland. But I would also so say, boring. like, <laughs> inversely, I didn't think any of them were particularly good actors. Like no. they weren't they weren't working with the greatest material, but. I didn't get like a performance from any of them that felt like too fun or hamming it up, hamming yeah. it up yeah. or yeah. relatable so or sympathetic. You mentioned the comic relief character, Aaron. Mm. He's one of my least favorites. Of course, he's it's always the fat guy, you know, the fat <laughs> man. and it's like he and a lot of his comic relief is like him saying inappropriate things or just like straight up slapstick like him walking into yeah. into glass and oh isn't it funny ha 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 the fat kid ran into a glass door like it right. or like even like just like from the jump like his opening line was like he they were all at that bar or whatever and he was like 
fuck this shit for no reason. And he throws his drink at her yes. for yes. no and she, reason. And, and she doesn't even respond to it. Like he walks up and, and like and no one acknowledges it after afterwards. Like <laughs> what the hell? It was so it weird. The, the sucks film. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of my favorite lines from him, I wrote this one down too, is um, get the fuck out of my safe space, bro. <laughs> I have oh, a yeah. question. Oof. Okay. Did you look up how old these guys were, the, the writer director pair? Because I felt at times like they hello, were fellow kids. old people. Yeah, hello, fellow children. Like yeah. old uh, Scott, people writing for. Oh my God. Scott ben, that makes so much sense. Scott, because a quote that I wrote down was that when he was like, the only thing Bailey is scared of is if Planned Parenthood were to be defunded. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that God. was a lie, oh. wasn't it? Uh. What? Was that like a slut joke? Like, what? Was that that, that was, was that was a slut joke, and they oh. had like That's an extended weird. thing about like not being able to survive without their phones. Early oh, yeah. when they first had to lock them in the oh, box, yeah. and it's just like, oh my god. Oh, um, my god. To answer your question, surprisingly, no, they are not old. They were both born in 1984, so they're in their mid 30s. <laughs> And presumably they wrote uh, this and A Quiet Place several years ago. So uh, they wrote these lines probably when they were close to our age, a little older. So like, <laughs> it's it's not a it's not a case of like uh, like a studio horror movie where some 50 year old dude is writing uh, lines for 15 year olds. Yeah, it's not like Slender Slenderman. Man. Yeah. <laughs> um. When that when a fucking 10th grader in high school makes a fucking uh, karate kid reference. <laughs> like, yeah, you can really tell the age of your writers. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, I I will say another thing that I do like about this movie is like the general aesthetic. I think that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, the production design is pretty good. The sets are great. We have seen the cinematographer before. We have talked about one of his films on the podcast. It's the same cinematographer who did The Strangers Pray at Night. Oh, really? Yes. I mean, I guess that makes sense with it, how colorful this movie was at times the production design was really good in this movie but it was kind of baffling to me at the same time because it was almost too nice for this like ramshackle you know mm -hmm. middle of nowhere you know like abandoned factory yeah, yeah. murder fort Murder for it. Once again, <laughs> I would have liked this movie to be trashier. With something like this, mm -hmm. you gotta go. You gotta go like grindhouse levels. Like, yep. use the same kind of like colorful palette. Like the cinematographer is great for that. But like, shoot it on fucking film. Like, get some grain in there. Like, make it make the blood and gore really over the top. Yeah, give like, me some of that mm -hmm. trauma, like gore and excess and. You know, sleaziness almost. <laughs> I love the part. Um, my, I think this was my favorite part when they like rocked up to the haunted house and the character who introduced the haunted house to them in the first place <laughs> was like reading somewhere on the internet that all the proceeds of this haunted house was going to the Red Cross. <laughs> <laughs> Completely what? missed that. Yeah, no. no, I remember that. No, I didn't oh, see that. God. What the f what? Which I was like, what? What? Like I. Uh so what? that, I I mean, that means this haunted house is advertising on the internet. They're murder <laughs> fort. They're advertising their murder fort. Oh, right. God. And they're trying to act like they're charitable. Like, I don't understand what. Yeah, I, I think they were in, the, the in the same breath, they were talking about how it had like no Yelp reviews. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that like they just have like one of those road signs for like emergency work and like messages and stuff and it just says haunted house but like the bulbs on haunt are brighter so it's like haunt ed house for and movie that 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 brings yeah. me that brings me back to another really uh good question I think uh to boost up my own uh self esteem about to ask this good question <laughs> is uh why the fuck is this movie called haunt 
There's nothing supernatural in it. There's nothing haunted. It's a fucking extreme haunted house. There's so many better titles you could have come up with. I don't understand the branding strategy of this film. Yeah, they should have just <laughs> called it Murder Fort. Yeah, exactly. They should have called God, it Murder yes. Fort. And also, yeah. like, when you first suggested, asked if we could watch this, like, there are enough other movies called Haunt or The Haunt or some version of it that, like, I had to get clarification from you on which one right. you were talking about. It doesn't even stick out like in any way. <laughs> yeah, like call it like murder fort or like passion of the clowns or, you know, something, yes. anything that would like mm -hmm. make it seem unique. But, you know, I guess that would sort of be false advertising because this movie is just about <laughs> as generic as its title. Yeah, it truly feels like a streaming filler movie. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's another character that I would like to talk about, and I would specifically like to get your opinion on, Aaron, um, because we've talked about the evil ex-boyfriend, but I want to talk about, like, the the love interest, like, potential new boyfriend. See, I like baseball. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad you asked me that because I actually wrote down, I have some notes on him. Excellent. First of all, <laughs> their first, like, their quote-unquote meet cute was like, <laughs> like <laughs> they. She's sitting at a table, and he waves her over, and then she crawls underneath said table, and goes to him, and she says, "Hey," and he's like, "Hey," and then he's like, "Can I help you?" And she's like, "You wait." <laughs> and he goes, "Sorry, I was just gesturing for another drink." And then out of shot, like a bartender hands him a beer, <laughs> and she's like, "Oh, sorry," and he goes, "No worries." So what's your name? <laughs> God damn, that's a story they'll be telling their kids. <sighs> right? So off the bat, I'm like, oh, God. And then, like, okay, I wrote down the quote where, which we should talk about, too, because she leaves the club and the cloaked figure shows up, yes. which also doesn't add up. I also made a like, note of this. I know where you're going oh, with this. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So then they're chatting or whatever, and he, she goes, I think I should go. And he says, I think you should stay. And it cuts to a shot of her, like, smiling, and then she's like, okay. And then it mm. cuts to a shot of them in a car. So basically what I have to say about that is that the main character is, like, constantly being persuaded by this, like, male love interest who does, like, the bare minimum to keep her interested. Even when they're getting out at the haunted house, she's like, no, I really should go. And he's like, no. You should stick around. She's like, mm, all right. You know, like he doesn't actually put in any effort to like woo her. You know what I mean? Like, okay. So what, what I also want to mention that scene when she goes outside and sees the cloaked figure um, and he comes out and talks to her and he starts telling her about how like he broke his arm or something when he was playing baseball his cheekbone or, or his yeah his that's right his cheekbone yeah. his, which looks his, fine his beautiful symmetrical yeah. like n nice bone structured face like he talks about how his face was all fucked up and then after that he's like so what about you? Why don't you tell me something about something traumatizing that happened to you? Is it, is, and he says, isn't that what Halloween's about? Telling scary stories? It's like, oh, yeah. Our de oh, it's like, uh, yeah, so Halloween, the, the time of year where we share candy and talk about our personal trauma. Yeah, the, the, time we talk, the time we talk about horrible things that have happened to us in the past. Like, yeah, that's what, te that's what telling scary stories is about. Not some what bullshit. Halloween is all about. <laughs> Not some bullshit about like, uh, like Bloody Mary or like hook hand man door ho hand hook. You Nothing know? like talking about personal trauma with someone you've met five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Just like unloading all of your baggage, like right off the bat. Like, yeah, you're just like telling their kids in the future. Yeah. When I met your dad, he just asked me about like all of my past trauma and I told him and, and we've been in love ever since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's like, I have a great, oops, let me rephrase that. I had a great relationship with my parents. And he's like, that's okay. I don't really talk to my parents that much anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Another great point to mention the fact that he's supposed to be like the love interest is when they go into the haunted house and they find the quote unquote maze and they have like one sign that's saying like this way is safe and the other sign that's saying this is not safe. Both, <laughs> neither of which turn out to be like indicative at all like nothing yeah. really happens with that oh, but right. i think it's worth noting that he goes off on a different direction than she does like with they the different girls with uh, with yeah. the other girls yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> after he convinced her twice to like stay and come through this haunted house that she did not want to go to and then he it the seems- first chance he gets, he's like, see ya. What is his relationship with the rest of the group, by the way? That he because doesn't it have seems one. like he knows everyone else, but yeah. like he's just because yeah, he is friends her. with comic relief guy. Yeah. Is he? Well, well, because um, her roommate hugged him at the beginning, remember? And she was like, hey, I'm so glad you're at this party. He was like, oh, yeah. great, thanks. I was just thinking. And then she goes up roommate. to that other guy and she's like, hey, like, <laughs> hugs that other guy. So, yeah, it seems I think to me that was the only indication. It seems to me they, like he was really just like perusing his options, you know, because like, yeah, <laughs> really, really like not a likable character. And speaking of unlikable characters, the roommate, too, right? Who yes. basically steals her mom's ring? It's oh my just god! Like... <laughs> I thought that same thing. I was like, "What?" She she wholly admitted, "Oh, I was in your room the other day because I was stealing your jewelry." And I was like, "That's not how roommates work. Mm-hmm. Like, girls don't do that." <laughs> yeah, and like the the main character just kind of like rolls her eyes and laughs, like, "Oh, Bailey," or whatever that character's name is, like. Yeah. And she, like, takes the ring off of, like, the the mannequin hand, and the heroine's like, be careful with that, that's my mom's ring. She's like, oh, yeah, don't worry, I'll give it back, and just, like, leaves the room. It's like, what? Which, also, also, probably, yeah. like, she lives with her, she knows the situation with her mom, she knows, like, her traumatic past and how that's probably, like, an, a very important object to her, but just gonna wear it on Halloween, you know, like, go out and get drunk <laughs> oh, okay. and, you know, like, lose your mom's fucking wedding, wedding ring or whatever, like... Right. Like, that um, scene also gave way to one of my other favorite quotes when she turns to her and goes, do you know, she's talking about the abusive ex-boyfriend. Do you know how I know that he's an alcoholic? Because he's an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. That line is fucking insane. Like, what like, does oh, that? No. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> It was like five minutes into the film, too. I was like, what am I getting myself into? (laughs) Yeah, and like once again, going out of its way to like set up this guy as like a a problematic negative character who then briefly turns into the hero before dying uselessly. Like decide (laughs) decide what you want your characters to be. God damn it. Because like there's so much fucking inconsistency. The most consistent characters are the main character who, like I said, makes the same facial expression the entire movie Mm -hmm. and the fat Mm -hmm. comic relief guy who just walks into things and is generally clumsy. And (laughs) like, that's it. And nobody else has like any kind of consistent character arc what i also we have to talk about because i wrote down a fair amount on this is we i want to talk about our protagonist's uh quote unquote tragic backstory it's time (laughs) we were expecting this to be the big twist of the movie right they you know because the movie was setting us up to think it was going to be early on they're hinting (laughs) at stuff like the the mom's ring it's like oh what happened to the mom like there's some you know there's some tension there like we see uh like weird uh flashback cuts to like a house and like an american flag she's nervous about people following her she's nervous about people following her like it (laughs) seems it seems like halloween is like a generally miserable time of year for her (laughs) you know so it's like setting up that and of course like the the completely uh insane conversation with the love interest about like past trauma it sets all this stuff up and we think like okay there's got to be some twist and we we have put together a uh that i wrote it all down uh a a tragic backstory for our heroine (laughs) that i think turns out to be way better than what the actual tragic backstory is uh, oh my so God. I'm going to share I'm going to share this with you, Aaron, and and let us know what you think. This was a collaborative yeah. effort between all yes. of us. This is what we were hoping. I'm so excited. We were yeah. predicting okay. this through the whole. Yeah, this yeah. is we were we were building early on. We were building this like based on the very few context clues we had. Um, so 
the spooky music and okay. pictures of fences. All right. So our, <laughs> so our thought excited. our thought is that when our heroine was about five, she accidentally killed her mom in a Halloween related accident. You know, Ooh. I don't know what kind of Halloween related accident, but it happened on Halloween. You know, maybe her mom fell on a knife that she had left out or something. She dropped you know? a pumpkin on her uh, head or something. She dropped a pumpkin on her. There was uh, a razor blade in the candy, you know, something like that. And her drunken stepdad swore his revenge and Ooh. has been hunting his stepdaughter ever since. But then it turns out that the mom didn't actually die. She was just horribly disfigured. So now she and the stepdad have Ooh. set up this elaborate haunted house to get revenge on their daughter. But then <laughs> it also it also turns out that the heroine's uh, abusive ex-boyfriend who we've been talking about is secretly her half brother who was born after the accident. So she never actually <laughs> knew that he was there. And so he's been working with the mom and the stepdad to set up this haunted house. And he was like. Uh, pretending to be her boyfriend to like lure her into this trap, right? So I that see. that was that was our head cannon, but yep. okay. Well, that would make more sense as to why the red cloaked figure was there outside of the haunted house in the first place when they were meeting outside of the bar. Yep. Right. Doesn't that that like never connects, right? It, it never or does because they turn onto the property for different reasons. Right. Right. Well, the funniest part is we see the cloaked figure and then later they find like a flyer on the ground of the haunted house. So I'm just gathering that the hooded figure like was standing there spookily and then just <laughs> dropped a flyer and then ran off. <laughs> just walking around dropping flyers, hoping somebody would pick it up. But yeah, I mean, like, of course, the red herring is that, like, the, the devil cloaked guy is is the ex-boyfriend, you know? So we, hmm. we really thought that there was going to be something, like, uh, you know, interesting and twisty and turny like that. Right. But then it turns out that her dad was just drunk and, like, beat on her mom. And, like, her mom isn't dead. Yeah. Right. And it's like, it's yeah. it's the most generic and like uninteresting non-twist that they possibly <laughs> could have done. Like even the reveal of that is just like, oh yeah, I was hiding under the bed when my dad like beat my mom and I picked up her ring off the ground. But then her mom is okay and like still lives right. at the same house. So like, why is she acting like her mom is dead? <laughs> Right. Doesn't it drive you guys nuts sometimes for like going to film school and being like watching these movies that were actually spent like millions of dollars on to be producing? You're like, I could write something way better than this. <laughs> like, yes, all the time. Tweaks. <laughs> I didn't even go to film school. It makes I feel me so frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like if but we like, didn't if we didn't have these movies we wouldn't be able to have these episodes of the podcast. You know, so <laughs> you know it's a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we've got the the matching lakefront yeah, uh, brewery got, glasses. The, the lakefront glasses. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> How about All that? Right. Milwaukee, <laughs> Milwaukee strong. <laughs> But I like that twist a lot better. Yeah, because it led up to the end. So the thing is, too, is like the haunted house alluded to the fact that it was going to cater to everybody's like worst fears. So she ended up with her having to be under the bed. That was like that flashback. But that's not necessarily like a worst fear of hers. That was just like also like how would the people traumatic? How, yeah. How would they know that they're just they're just random carnies, you know, like that's true. they don't have any relation to her whatsoever. So it's like the fact that that she goes into that room where she has to like crawl under the bed to find a clue or something is just like completely <laughs> coincidental incidental to like uh you know be a parallel to her backstory and mm -hmm. it's it's so ineffective and it's like <laughs> it, it feels like it's supposed to be like a powerful moment for her uh, like taking back her agency like when the devil guy comes over and tries to pull her out from under the bed like her dad did but she stabs mm -hmm. him in the eye and it's like it's her taking back her power and it's but yeah. it's, I'm the monster under the bed but it, but it yeah. it's set up in such a clumsy way that it doesn't feel cathartic at all it's, right. it's like it's it's a fun like little gore effect like her stabbing him in the eye 
but <laughs> what is it like what does it actually accomplish you know it's so half baked because you get you know the spiders and the under the bed and i think one of the characters said they're like scared of small spaces or something oh yeah so they're claustrophobic uh right but it doesn't really resolve for all the characters and it doesn't resolve intelligently but in any like the claustrophobic respect. character doesn't like have a panic attack when they have to like crawl through like the no maze they're fine or whatever they're, right like there's there's not like nothing that comes of that at all and honestly, like, if you were going to give fears to all of them, like the spiders or the claustrophobia, that's fine. But then you should also give a backstory as to why they were so scared of those things, because that's what they did with the main character, I guess, with, like, hiding under the kind bed. Of. So it's like, it would have added a little bit of context to be like, this person's scared of being claustrophobic because they were trapped in a closet for eight hours once for some reason. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, they got stuck it was in just... an elevator or some, like, yeah. anything, anything. Right. And once like, again, like the the people who have set up this extreme haunted house have no way of knowing that these people are scared of these things. They were leaving <laughs> fucking flyers on the ground. They were leaving flyers <laughs> on the ground and they left a receipt for like their Halloween decorations like <laughs> lying on the floor of one of the rooms. Also, I think it's very worth noting that like the the villains have obviously forgotten about the majority of what they've set up within this haunted house because they fall into their own traps constantly <laughs> constantly the the shotgun on the timer is the worst offender right yeah like, like that the, that whole sequence that guy had to know that yeah. that like they he which they ripped from saw too right yeah the 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 whole fucking shotgun door key thing was just straight up stolen from saw too but also like once she gets through there and is like in the hallway where the shotgun is, the devil guy who's chasing her has completely forgotten that the shotgun is there and allows himself yeah. to be fucking murked by it. I think I she mean, does like <laughs> lift him up into it a little bit. Like there's something to be said she for like, that. But like what's even yeah. dumber too is like afterwards she gets up to try and shut it off and she, she just walks it. right in front of it. She <laughs> sees the shotgun. She knows what it is, what it does, and like could just crawl to it. Could could do literally anything to avoid like this this shotgun blast. And no, she puts her hand up in front of herself. Yeah. Like, and is just about to hear the click for it to go off, and it doesn't, and she's saved. And it, it's just like way to way to make your protagonist look smart. Just duck. Just duck. That's literally uh. it. Can I ask you guys a question? Sure, um, absolutely. Can you shed some light on the Mitch character? Because Loki, he was my favorite character, but I don't know if he was trying to help them or if he was if it was all a ploy. But like, oh yeah, I mean, it was for sure a ruse because like when he got outside, he immediately <laughs> murdered the fat kid. He just killed the guy. And, yeah, right, and, right. and ripped his face off with a claw hammer, like which but is like, one of the cooler effects in the movie, but. Mm -hmm. It was cooler. And I was like, OK, Academy Award goes to Mitch because he was like, yo, I know we're kind of intense, but we're all about safety here. And so for a while, I was like, OK, maybe this guy is just being like tricked into like working here or whatever. But like part of me feels like he just ripped him to shreds because he was an asshole. Like he realized that this like character was like kind of a dick. And so he changed his mind. Well, the funniest <laughs> part is later on we get yes. the new guy character. There is that actual who's character. Who's not like body modified at all. He's just a normal dude <laughs> that went out to the store to buy shit for them. Because so they like <laughs> promised him that he could be one of them if he did this. Right. And he so like. He is that character that you've just described, like the one who has been like tricked into working on this thing and like tries to help them. But before he can help them in any meaningful way, he just gets fucking ventilated by the chainsaw guy. So like, That's right, it's the I, <laughs> I assume Mitch should have been honestly. Right. I mean, I think I think the Mitch character is interesting. He's sinister enough that at least we all realize that he was like fucking with them the whole time that he was just like waiting for an opportunity to get them alone so he could fuck them up. The the quote unquote twist that I actually think is one of the cooler concepts that's underdeveloped is like the people who are running who have set up this haunted house are like extreme like body 
body mod guys that have like mm-hmm. fucked up their faces to make them look like Halloween masks. Fun I think, idea. I right. think that's I think that's a cool concept, especially because like all of the masks that they're wearing are like cheap paper mache and look like shit. And it's kind of cool to like have them take those cheap masks off and reveal like the actually scary masks underneath. Mm-hmm. Like I I think conceptually yeah. that's really interesting, but nothing ever comes of it, you know. And Mitch is the yeah. one who is like the most like fucked up face guy. And so I don't think that I don't think that he was ever trying to help them, but I think that still it ends up being like kind of unsatisfying regardless, you know? Right. And yeah. Same with yeah. us them like setting us up to think that they have like a leader. They have this like a lo- spooky a good guy? one in the with the bone mask that ends up being um the roommate. Oh yeah, the roommate that they just yeah. put a right. mask and a cape on, and which called please, you that called, an a, like an hour before it happened. You did, you did call that way, way before it happened because it's so tropey. Like every movie does it, where like they have the one like hooded figure that you think the protagonist thinks is one of the bad guys, and they stab them and, and unveil. Sure, oh no, it's actually they're gagged. And know. sure enough, yeah, the the protagonist stabs that that hooded and masked figure with a pitchfork, and then oh, it turns out it's her roommate. Yep. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, can't say I was sad to see her go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the few deaths that isn't head trauma. Yes, related. that's literally, a great segue. Literally the only death that isn't head trauma This movie related. is so fascinated with people getting killed by getting stabbed in the head or... Shot in the uh, head, shot in the head or beaten or in the head, branded. whacked in the head. Yep. Yeah. Every single character except for the roommate that dies dies from head trauma of some sort. <laughs> Even when like the 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 romantic interest goes back to their car after they've gotten out and gets the bat and like just fucking uh Babe Ruth's that uh the the chainsaw guy in the face. Good or bad, no one is safe from from head trauma. Right, exactly. <laughs> Also, like, why didn't they kill the chainsaw guy when they had the chance? Great like, question. When he, when they like, chances. When they like pin his arm to the wall with like the hatchet or whatever. Like, why don't they just kill him then? Because he comes back with the gun and shoots the the love interest like in the gut, which is then immediately <laughs> forgotten about. Just like every other major injury in this movie, like when the protagonist <laughs> steps on that nail like gruesomely and pulls yes. her foot off of it, and then it's fine and no. it's not even walking with no, a limp. No, but even worse, that rips the skin off of her hands and is in, in yes. the next scene handling shit. Like, like no. nothing is wrong. You never see any. Any damage to her hands she never acts like there's any damage to her hands after yeah. that scene and we see it in like and gruesome gritty detail too like the skin just get fully ripped off of like the pads of her hands and then the next scene just down. handling shit what type of glue will rip your skin off like that like airplane glue <laughs> like, I don't right. know, like, like it must be some industrial strength shit well because sure industrial it, strength shit dries really fast they sure so there's exactly. no glue there's no glue that exactly. does that exactly did they did a carney put it there Immediately before she like set her hand. Quick, she's coming. Oh, it was the the new guy. Was another the... another one of my favorite. Uh, one thing that actually made me laugh in this movie in that same scene is when she's like looking around with the flashlight and she like sees a trap or something and like follows the rope up and along the ceiling and down the wall and it's like this huge elaborate Rube Goldberg thing and then the <laughs> beam of the flashlight falls on the devil guy who just like looks over at her. As he's like sawing through the rope with the machete. <laughs> it's like such a fucking slat, like comedic cut. Like just see him over there, just like turn his head as he's just like <laughs> frantically sawing through this rope. And like even like the rope sawing sound is there. Yeah, like it's, it's like, like right out of like like the coyote, like Roadrunner Looney Tunes shit. It's like why why not like he has a fucking machete. Why not just like swing it down and just like cut the rope clean? <laughs> like it's so fucking right. it's so fucking funny. <laughs> and, and that's one of the few moments in this movie that I actually laughed really hard because it's just so unexpected and like out of the tone of the rest of the movie. I wanted more to be like that. Yes. Agreed. It would have been more fun that way. 
I agree as well. Oh, let's talk about the lady villain. Oh my god, the dumbest shit. I was gonna say it a second like, ago. Yes. A minute before dying off. The dumbest death. Oh my god. <laughs> the dumbest the death. Stupid shit. <laughs> like, nose. Okay, so the love interest and our protagonist are coming up out of the 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 sewer hole. Uh, or they're coming the, up onto the roof. The basement hole. Oh. The, tr- the trap door oh, onto the, the roof. That's right. So yeah. trap door. They're coming up out of a trap door. Thank you. Onto the roof. And our protagonist gets out. And then uh, uh, Lady Mask. Witch Mask. Yeah, Witch Mask. Carney. And then she takes her mask off and she's got a witch face underneath. Yeah. It's <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> and, uh, and then she steps on the latch, which hits the boyfriend. We hear him go, ah. And, and she hears him go, ah. And then he starts slamming on it. While she's standing on top of the trap door. Yep. So the the villainous Carney, she's standing on top of the trap door. The the love interest is like pounding on underneath. And then like a goldfish, she just <laughs> forgets that he's underneath the, the, the thing that she just closed and steps Correct. forward and lets him come out and kill her. And he immediately, without wasting a second, opens the trap door, grabs her ankles, pulls her down in the ladder and then uses the door <laughs> to bash her head in. door to like crush her skull. another head trauma another head and trauma like, and it's like she literally forgot about him being there half a fucking like, second like she doesn't have object permanence <laughs> like, <laughs> like a baby <laughs> <laughs> Once again, though, all of these fucking villains are not scary because they completely forget about yeah. stuff. Like, what the fuck yeah. is up with the continuity in this movie? Like, I swear. Yeah. And they don't have any tie to any of these people in any way. So it's like, why are we attached to these villains right? at all? Like, yeah. we, what's the, their motivation? The closest we get is when the the new guy is, like, trying to help them and is like, I think one of them owns a tattoo shop. That's literally <laughs> the only backstory anything we get from these villains. And, like... Once again, I think the idea of like the extreme body modding to turn your face into a real life Halloween mask is a cool concept. And if you're going, if you want to make these villains scary, then expound upon that. Even without getting anything for them, they're still the most interesting thing in this movie. Absolutely. And yeah, like, oh, God, I just wanted more. And and two, like they have no characterization to them at all. Like Mitch is the only one we get. And his whole bit is he's an average dude like sounding dude and then he has like a, a fucked up face right and then the others like the devil one like does some cool like deep devil i'm spooky voices and that's it like the clown guy yeah. doesn't do any crazy giggles we get no slapstick crazy stuff from them and you'd think if they've devoted their life and like risked their their lives like to set up a, like a murder kill house that they'd get more joy out of it right or they'd like they'd at least or they'd get off doing it in some it way seems, but they almost, don't they're just kind of like doing it right like almost. they're there for work it's like <laughs> We gotta, gotta yeah. do the, set up the murder fort again. I'm fucking so tired of doing this. I think that, like, maybe one of the only effective moments in the movie is that scene where, like, the devil guy has caught the main character and she still thinks that it's, like, her ex-boyfriend and she's like, uh, oh, yeah. it's, like, Sam, please don't hurt me. And he, like, yeah. takes the mask off. Fuck is Sam. And you see, like, his black <laughs> eyes and the tattoos and, like, these metal spikes that he's had inserted into his face. And, like, that reveal is dope. But she's like, who's Sam? I, I thought that yeah. was, like, the only moment in the movie where I was like, ah, cool yep. like that <laughs> and and then just like immediately just immediately like, yeah that subversion would have been fine if we just gotten more of them honestly the um, biggest thing is i wish we had more of the new guy because i think the oh, new the guy new gives guy. so much context to how absurd the whole situation is First day on the job, which means, obviously, they only do this on Halloween day. Right. Once a year. (laughs) Maybe this is the first time they've done it, too. Mm -hmm. He's doing it so he can get the crazy face himself. Yeah, he wants in. I guess he just wants the the discount on the body modification stuff. So he's helping (laughs) out to get get a discount. If you think about it, he's really the most interesting character in the movie, yeah, isn't he? And get, the, he gets yeah. way over his <laughs> in way <laughs> over his head, not realizing the stakes of the situation. Oh god, I want to see that movie. 
I want to see right, the movie honestly. from his perspective where like he falls in with him. He thinks it's just going to be like a cool haunted house. Wow, these guys are really into it. And I love edgy shit, too. Yeah, like that would be such a fun film. And like him slowly realizing like during the course of the night that like his buddies are actually murderers and I'm him trying to up. turn it around and like help them. Like that would have been fun. Yeah, you guys are totally right. I didn't even like think about that aspect of their like mutilated faces but that's a whole story within itself it is yeah and honestly like like cleveland to your point if if they're like oh it's just a job like they, they're not even happy doing it well maybe they're like roped into doing it or maybe they're like prisoners basically you know like who knows like why they're there or chose to be there but yeah, who is like, their like leader said, who are these people yeah like there's that's no way more interesting of a story mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> there's yeah. like generic tropey yeah. college kids who you can't care about enough to like even feel emotionally invested when they die from head trauma yeah. and, all and of and that the leader stuff would even be a great second half twist you know uh because sure. like yeah. this movie needed a review of some sort to prove it's more clever than, exactly. you know. Just, it, it ended up being. Yeah, it ended up being. And the thing is, it's so haphazardly put together. They have a sign on the side of the road that they just hope that someone drives by so they can turn it on, you know? Right. They drop yeah. flyers on the fucking ground. Like, they're just hoping that someone comes. They're not trying to get people super hard what if to, like multiple what if like multiple groups come at once what if a line forms like what is it <laughs> they yeah I, I like how they well, even that's... they even go to the the extent to make a fake release form for them to sign <laughs> beforehand yeah. like there's so many holes in this stupid harebrained plan well yeah i have two thoughts to that too it's like Okay, when they were driving to said haunted house, um, there was a car that was following them. Did that ever get resolved? Remember, she was like, "Oh, I think that's a fantastic car- point." I think it was the ex. Nothing ever happened. I think they no, lost. No, but then they- the ex boyfriend was twenty <laughs> miles away because they, they lost. Because they lost right. him. Because they turned down the different road. But no, he, but then no, he, he had to use them. the GPS, and he was way on the other side of town. Yeah, I don't because well, maybe he gave up. Maybe he went to the other side of town to get some beer or something. Was that supposed to be the ex-boyfriend? He had enough time. Was it? Okay. Was it, was it the same car? I, I think it was. Remember. It was a pickup. I think it was him. What was your other point, Aaron? They were, like, hesitant about signing the forms, and then they heard a scream, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're definitely going to do this. And then they go in, but then realize that nobody except for that first girl that got murdered in front of them is there. So it's like, if I went to a haunted house and no one else was in it, like, wouldn't you feel a little like suspect like i feel like (laughs) right like a completely empty haunted house i'd be like nah this is fucked up like i'm gonna leave you know also (laughs) you didn't think anything of it (laughs) you've brought up a very good point about like the the girl that they hear scream who is then like the first girl they see murdered and they think it's just like an elaborate act but that opens up another series of interesting questions too is was she there by herself where are the rest of the people that she was with because presumably she would have gone with a group just like the other ones but we only see her we never see anybody else who's been like captured or murdered or what but there's no fucking way that girl would have gone into that fucking abandoned warehouse fucking uh coom haunted house by like, herself, the, by yeah, herself. Like well, so it's true. funny too because they destroy the car they came in on right and that's why they had to take the the pickup truck no not the pickup truck the, no they no, don't because do, the boyfriend or he the, gets his bat out of it yeah the the they just smash they, they, they smash the windows to take, okay they smash the windows to get in and take the, the keys, keys i guess it doesn't I but i guess that's presuming that also why would they leave the keys in the car, in the right. car. No, great question yeah. uh, but more importantly if you know more people came you'd expect them to like move the cars after they right. did the deeds yeah well uh, assuming like there they just shut the sign off and close the gate so no one can i mean in. i but once because again, they're like the last like, ones if you for the night. if you drove up to, if you drove up to a haunted house and there was nobody in line and no other cars and it's in the spooky ass warehouse <laughs> Majorly sus, yo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you didn't, they didn't even end up paying. Like, that was my biggest issue with them saying that. Another great that, point. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know, buy tickets. Like, they didn't buy tickets. They were like, I would like six tickets. And then the clown made them open up 
both of his hands that ended up being empty. And then he just pulled a key from behind that girl's ear and was like, here you go. <laughs> yeah, right. Give and this is... <laughs> And this is a haunted house that they believe from their own research online is donating <laughs> its proceeds to the Red, Red Cross, Cross. But then right. they're not asked to pay. Did they think that they were going to be asked to pay at the end of the haunted house? Because that's not how literally Amazing. anything works. <laughs> you pay for it before you go through it. Right. <laughs> Just so many red flags, and these characters are just completely idiotic. <laughs> I know. Well, and that's also like, and okay, this is like, maybe this is just like my film person brain, but like, if you go in and you see a person getting like branded, okay, first of all, the smell of human flesh, like just getting absolutely burned is disgusting, True. I imagine. And like... <laughs> They all just, like, started clapping. Yay, good performance, you know? But, like, you would know if a person was at, if you were watching a person getting murdered. Like, that girl, it was, like, very obvious. It's very that clear. She would, Her head's yeah. pulverized. Like, it's gone. It's no Sort of well, like with the first one, <laughs> with the first one, when the, the brand brand. touches her face, yeah, they, that one you could believe they hit the smoke machine. Yeah. So it's like it's supposed to be that like, one. Yeah. That... But when it's their friend. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah, when it's their friend, that's also like... because like a, a scene later, like they're chill about it, like after their friend gets because they're talking to hey, Mitch and like some of them are like complacent. Yeah, well, they're like, hey, we just want to get out of here. But they they do seem to, like, not be as concerned that they just watched their friend getting murdered. Yeah. There's even the verbal sleight of hand with, like, them trying to get Mitch to take his mask off. And then one of them's like, hey, but if we go down this way and they just forget to, like, force Mitch to take his mask off because right. clearly he's part of a gang that's yeah. murdering their friends. <laughs> no, well, even when like, the friend ADD. got murdered, like, yeah, there was a there was a little, like. Uh, line in the background when their friend got murdered and this girl was like, is she just acting? (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Yeah, like, we saw the fucking fire poker go through her skull. Like, is she okay? You think she's all right? Is she okay? (laughs) I also, like, another thing I don't understand is the whole prolonged putting your arm through the hole to, like, feel stuff on the other side. Is it brains? What is it? Right, and it's, it's so, it's, we know that at some point, like, someone sticking their arm through is gonna, like, something's gonna happen to them. Like, it's so obvious from the get-go, but they drag it out so mm-hmm. long of, like, yes. multiple characters reaching into the hole and be like, oh, it's spaghetti or, oh, it's grapes. It's and like, then, we know how it goes. And then, like, the one guy faking out, like, <laughs> something happening, and then the roommate being like, oh, no, I dropped, I dropped my roommate's ring back there. It's her mom's ring. I have to get it. And it's just, like, this whole thing keeps dragging dragging on and on and then what is all that happens she gets three like razor blade cuts on her arm <laughs> like i was expecting i was expecting her to get like her arm chainsawed off or like hacked to pieces or something right you know i was expecting some shit out of like green room like when he sticks his hand through the door and oh, gets yeah. his hand chopped off and it's like she pulls her arm out and looks at it it's just like three little like razor blade cuts Cuts. They're and tiny, yeah. They're too. Ti- yeah, it's like, I mean, yeah. okay, sure, anything, any degree of bodily harm is too much in a haunted house, obviously, but this is a fucking horror movie. Like, we've at right. this point, we've been waiting so long for, like, the horror to happen and for something to escalate. It's like, oh, man, yeah, she got some little cuts on her arm. Oh, boy, <laughs> that sure was good and exciting. I did love that. Especially because, like, they, they walk through the flammable maze that isn't actually ignited until they've all left. Yes. We don't we don't get to see them like trying to escape the flaming maze. Now that is almost certainly for production reasons, like if I had to guess. I forgot about that too, but they yeah. like go out of their way to set up that's like the walls of this maze are coated in oil and there's like bags, big oil bags. There's like bags of oil hanging above Which look them. Cool. And it's like you assume at some point like somebody is going to get caught in the flaming maze. Nope. And it's literally just 
the bad guy's way to destroy the evidence after the fact. And I feel like it's It's a terrible way to destroy the evidence because right. that fire is going to be seen from the most expensive hobby you can ever have. Right. You do you buy a huge warehouse once a year, set up a bunch of elaborate traps and then just burn it all down at the end of the night like <laughs> once again that's why I want to see more I want to know more backstory about these guys. I want to know how long they've been doing this. Like one of these body <laughs> mod guys must have like a hedge fund or something oh, that almost, he's just yeah, money certainly. through. <laughs> Which would be way more interesting. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of things not being interesting, do we have any other notes before we get to the dud finale? I don't think so. Aaron, do you have anything else? I There's the little bit of the end, which is extremely disappointing to wrap up. But if you have other parts <laughs> you want to talk about first, I want to do that. Um, No, I'm good. I'm good to go. Okay, cool. So uh, they, they get away the protagonist and the baseball love interest, uh, baseball boy, and she gets discharged from the hospital like a couple of hours after being admitted, which is wildly unbelievable because like she mm-hmm. has a hole in her foot. Her friend got gut shot. Like once again, everybody forgets about like really terrible injuries that happen to them almost immediately. But yeah. she she realizes that she had put her mom's address down on the release form she <laughs> signed at the beginning. Uh, so the, the only remaining killer, the clown man, uh, shows up at her mom's house to try to murder her. But not only has she been discharged from the hospital, but she's also had the time to set up some home alone traps for him. My biggest question is where is her Her mom? mom. Like she puts down some like sticky shit that sticks on his shoes and then comes and like he falls over conveniently onto a nail that like goes through his hand or whatever. And then she shows up with the shotgun that she's taken down from the mantelpiece and blows his head off. And where is her mom through all of this? How did she get out of the hospital so quickly? And where is her mom? And her stepdad. Where where is any of them? We don't know. We get the dream sequence right beforehand that's set up. You know, we think she's coming back home. And then it's, you know, she opens the door and it's the carnies or whatever. But and then she yeah. wakes up yep. after being and out for <laughs> presumably hours. Wakes up in the hospital, the hospital, yeah. So mm-hmm. where, where back, is her mom? We never get any home, resolution She's there. back home by dawn. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it doesn't make... <laughs> It doesn't make any sense at all. And then we, as the credits... My favorite part of the movie. As the credits roll, we get the true subversion. Oh my the God. The twist of the film. Incredible. And the, the credits music is a soft lounge piano cover of, of Dracula of Rob Zombie's Dracula <laughs> and dead through the witches and bad through the witches and slam in the back of my it sounded like Lana Del Rey almost I Aaron I wish I wish you could have been in the room when that happened I was in tears because we we legitimately like almost had a collective stroke like after after, after this, I thought it was having this like totally uninspired, like boring, dumb movie to like finish so strongly Do it, baby. With, a lo- with a lounge cover of Dragula. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I thought that I that I might have been dying. It was. Oh. It was it's such a weird song to do a slow piano cover of. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna see if I can find it, and that'll be our our outro music yeah. for this episode, yeah. if I can. Please, um, please do. It's great, Aaron. I do want to say, as much as we've ragged on this film and like we've we've talked about those points, I'm still very glad you picked it because it's been a lot of fun to talk about. Like it's it's always fun yeah. to pick these and like make fun of them and like just try to understand what anyone on the crew was thinking it's a baffling movie for sure and that's why i think it stands just slightly above your standard streaming service filler um just how bizarrely bad some of the choices are it's such it's such an enigma because like just like you brought up at the very beginning of the episode aaron it's like it's got these people these like legitimately talented and interesting people who have like worked on it and it doesn't have 
any of their hallmarks. Like, I know it was I know it was just produced by Eli Roth, but it's like the fucking Meg was produced by Eli Roth, and like True. that had that had like an Eli Roth sense of like fun and camp, and this yeah. movie was so humorless and like devoid of fun and it's like i just i don't understand why eli roth would want to put his name on it and it's just so like not clever or well written unlike a quiet place which they wrote at the same time as this movie (laughs) that's another like that's another thing that i cannot wrap my brain around like some of the magic would rub off from one to the other like they used all their high concept for (laughs) for a quiet place yeah (laughs) I, I yeah. you, know, you know what would be funny? I wonder because they like they they work as like a duo. So I wonder if like one, one of them's of, really one good. One of them's good and, and one, one of them's, them's bad, really bad. And that they like collaborate on stuff and like this is the bad ones sort of thing. <laughs> and a quiet place is the good ones thing. And that they just put their names on both of them. <laughs> because that would Honestly. actually that would actually explain a whole lot. Because they feel <laughs> they feel like very different visions <laughs> and the more yes. i talk about it the more i think that that's that might actually be the case <laughs> <laughs> they're like we'll take we'll take credit for both of them whether they're good or bad we don't care <laughs> right like you know they're they're friends they support each other so like they they put their names on on both their names on everything because they're like a collaborative pair but like this yeah. is this is the the one who's doesn't have as many good ideas and like quiet places like the the guy with the the more high concept stuff <laughs> um, Agreed. <laughs> yeah that's that's probably the case well i think in that case uh are we ready to rate this yeah Oh, well, yeah, what am I going to rate this? Uh, <laughs> better figure it out. Uh, Aaron, uh, uh, guests go first. Oh. What would you rate this? Um. Okay, to be honest, I'm not going to give it, like, nothing. It's not that bad. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to give it, like, a solid, like, two and a half because it made a very, for a very fun conversation to have. And that's, like, half the fun of horror sometimes is, like, you're not going to get like a bunch of gems. Like that's the gamble <laughs> that you take with horror. Um, but it is fun to watch like a bad horror film with a bunch of like fun company. Um, obviously like the two and a half is because of that. It's like because of the experience you get with it and not necessarily because of how good it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, like Ben mentioned, like it looks good. Um, so I'll give him that. Um, <laughs> but other than that, yeah, like the writing's not good and the acting is not great. So I'm going to go with the two and a half. All right. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm in just about the exact same place. It's, it's a very competently made film. It's not terrible. It's competently directed. Like it looks nice. The production design is good. The actors were acting you know they didn't give away anything particularly impressive the story is pretty stupid and a lot of it is quite uninspired and tropey but you know there's some cool ideas at the very least and it did make for a fun watch because uh you know sometimes the real movie is the friends we made along the way (laughs) something uh something along those lines uh i i had a great time talking about this and like i even had fun making fun of it while we were watching it so i'm gonna give it a two and a half as well that seems right about where it needs to be for me nice um normally i would give something like this uh, about it, I was thinking roughly around two uh, initially, uh, mediocre, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, as you guys have already mentioned. Uh, but I will give it an extra half a star for head trauma. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not 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 in the film, but the the head trauma it gave me uh, oh, uh, 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 for some of the confusing choices. Uh, really, <laughs> like I think considering the budget, literally all of the resources that this film had. Considering all of those things, there's such a better movie there in all of those assets. It's a shame. It's a damn shame that we didn't get that. But uh, the the head trauma, like, while it was repetitive, it looked great. Like, some of the kills looked good. Uh, and, you know, I'm here for the kills. I'm here for the set design, really. You know, the, the art was decent. Um, yeah. 
So 2.5 from me as well. All right, then bring well, us home. Well, unlike all of you guys, I'm going to give it a two. Um, so while, <laughs> like, I really thought it it was a shiny package, you know, the production design's good, the cinematography was good, this movie just screams mispotential to me. There were so many avenues where they could have gone in way more interesting directions, whether it's the new guy or the body modification or it actually being haunted or anything it could have literally done anything had any sort of clever twist <laughs> or subversion doing anything other than what was completely expected and what was built upon and i would have respected it a lot more the thing is it doesn't do any of that and the characters are very hollow and one-dimensional and while it's entertainingly bad which is why I won't give it like half star or one star or anything. I just wanted something more clever. And even if it was dumb, even if you had a dumb twist, give me that over no twist any day of the week. I think you're right. I would agree. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, that will give Haunt an average of 2.4 out of 5. Honestly, if this movie has done anything, it's made me a little bit more nervous for A Quiet Place Part 2. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> I've now seen, like, the other end of the spectrum that these guys are capable of. And, I mean, I would like to think that uh, that John Krasinski is, like, a better director than, than, these, than these guys. But, like, <laughs> I'm really hoping they didn't just get lucky with the first Quiet Place. The um, more I've seen The Quiet Place place two trailer the more i get nervous honestly yeah, same. It, it just screams what if humans were the real bad guys <laughs> and it's just like oh, we've seen that so many times literally, literally on the road again <laughs> just talked about it on our last episode for 28 days later like it's uh yeah i don't know we'll see if the movie ever comes out if covid ever releases us from <laughs> It's cold and deadly grasp, and movies are a thing again. Yeah, but... the, the Last of Us, A Quiet Place, Part Road. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, next week we uh, are going to be talking about uh, Cleveland's Choice, yes. uh, a, a episode that we actually have already recorded. That's right. So, uh, uh, don't break kayfabe. <laughs> no, I did. I whispered, so it's not. It's not official. Uh, but next week we will be talking about a uh, Japanese film from 1960 called Jigoku, Jingoku. or it, Hell in English. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a, a fun episode. So tune back in next week well, to a fun movie. Uh, uh, check that out. Um, Cleveland. Why don't you head on over to the sponsor shelf and tell us who's sponsoring the show this week? Yes, sir. Okay, let me just pull this off the shelf. All right. Oh, it's a short one this week, but uh, it's a good one. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, this week of Pod People was brought to you by the all-new 2006 Sunday Pinata, <laughs> the only car that's festive enough to drive with your third eye. <laughs> A 14-year-old car that never goes out of style. Oh, it's all new. It's the all new 2006 <laughs> model. Thanks. You heard it. Thanks, Sunday Pinata. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see what there is to, to understand. You're, you're, you're tracking, right? Oh, no, yeah. I good, mean, good, I'm good. mostly just like looking at my bank account and what Sunday Pinata paid us for, you know, this, uh, <laughs> this excellent sponsor. They paid you us know. currency. We are uh, famously the uh, most sponsored podcast in the world. The wealthiest it's true. It's podcast. The wealthiest it's true. podcast mm. in the world. Um, I have heard that. Yeah. Wealthy with sponsors. That's right. You know, because <laughs> we, have, we have so many sponsors delivered to us by the Eldritch sponsor shelf. That um, <laughs> we we are really uh, we're dripping in sponsors mm -hmm. uh, and as, oozing as and... the kids are saying these days. Yep. Um, all right, well that'll bring us to the end of this week's episode. Uh, if you like the show, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five star rating and a nice review. You can follow us on Twitter 
at podpeoplepod or on letterbox.com slash podpeoplepod for a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those episodes. Uh, feel free to tweet at us what movies you'd like to uh, hear us talk about as this episode has proven. Uh, we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> just, just tweet at us and we'll fucking do it. Tell us we won't. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Aaron is proof of that. So uh, hit us up on Twitter. You can also follow Follow me on Twitter at Deep State Ozzy. I'm on Twitter at Mr. Sheets. And I'm occasionally tweeting for Light Arc Studios with further progress on our early access game, It Stares Back. Check us out on Steam. We're quite proud of our work so far, and we've got more updates on the way. Is there anything you want to plug, Aaron? No. <laughs> I'm not doing shit right now, so. <laughs> not even like your Twitter or something to get those followers? Maybe a charity you like? <laughs> the Red Donate Cross. to the Red Cross. <laughs> Honestly, if you want to, like, message me on Facebook, that'd be cool. I'm trying to stay entertained in quarantine. Um, I don't even know my, oh, I think my Twitter handle is Voluminati. It is. Um, Which is good very name. Oh, I, I like love that. Thank you. It's a follow for um, me, for sure. Honestly, my tweets are really funny and they don't get enough recognition, so everyone should follow me. <laughs> I agree. Your tweets your tweets are infrequent, but good. So follow Aaron Thanks. at Voluminati. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, talking about Haunt with us. Thank you for making us yeah, watch. Thank Haunt. you indeed. Because if and if anything, I discovered that piano cover of Dragula. Yes, and true. That honestly, classic. That, that really makes the whole thing I, worth it. I think I unironically love it. <laughs> I haven't decided yet. I don't know about that, but I love it in some way. <laughs> Do it, baby. Unironic or otherwise. Um, yeah, Aaron, please come back on the show literally anytime please. you want. Like, we're just here in quarantine watching movies, so... I would love to. This has been such a good time. And I do watch good movies, too. I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about what you want your next choice to be, and you can prove it to everybody out there that you do have good taste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll make sure of that. All thank right. you, guys. Well, thank you all for listening. Tune back in next week to hear our thoughts on Jigoku. And... Uh, until next time, I uh, get some face tattoos, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>